Tonight's topic, in the valley of the shadow of death. And the writer of this article was David Farr. Uh, Brother Farr has, has been a, a good servant of the Lord for, for many years. Um, at the time of the writing of this article, I don't know if he's still in Rock Hill, South Carolina or not. But that's where he was at the writing of this article. And he starts off with jokes. When you deal with a difficult topic, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it, it helps to lighten the mood. So he talks about this cancer patient who, who went into the hospital and, and, and said they had an appointment to, to see a doctor. And the receptionist asked tactus, tactlessly, callously, uh, are you terminal? Well, the, the man took it in stride and he said, we all are. Mm -hmm. Because really, we are. Yeah. You know, when you think about it, this is one of, the, one of those things that, that no man living today is going to avoid unless Jesus returns first. Mm -hmm. There is record of, of some in the Old Testament who did not see death. Uh, Enoch, uh, Elijah. But... For the most part, it, it's just a general rule. Everybody's going to die. At some point, you're going to die. Uh, it is not necessary to go to the Bible to know that fact. Well, we just look around. I mean, we had a terrible incident yesterday uh, where, was it 14 kids? And a teacher. 17 and 2. I think it's up to about 22 now. 19 and 2. Okay. Yeah. That's what, you know, it, it's something that for some comes rather unexpectedly. Uh, for others, we kind of see it coming, you know. Um, there's the, the common jest, and, and I think it was Mark Twain that originated this, but I might be wrong on that. I, re I read the obituaries in the newspaper every morning just to make sure that I, I'm not listed, right? John Dunn reminds us that we share in humanity's moral mortality. Never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. The woman of Tekoa reminded the king in 2 Samuel in chapter 14 and verse 14 she said for we must needs die and are as water spilt on the ground which cannot be gathered up again when death comes that's the end of the line for our lives that is not the end of the line for our souls and that's something that we need to keep in mind throughout a, a discussion of this topic. Job, and we're going to talk a lot about Job tonight. Chapter 14 and verse 12. He says, So man lieth down and riseth not. Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 is appointed unto men once to die. And after that, the judgment. There is coming a day when we will not wake up in this life. Where our days on this earth will be done. Turn over to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Many of you can probably quote it. it it's a favorite of, of many. It's not my favorite psalm, but it is a favorite of many. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the, uh, in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Verse 4, of course, is where Brother Farr took the title of his article from. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We all go through valleys at some point in our lives. We all face things that we never thought we'd have to face. We, we deal with situations we would never thought that we'd have to deal with. But the one that is common for all of us is death. And that is going to come at some point. The writer of the psalm, David, he was a shepherd. You might be able to imagine a shepherd leading his sheep through, through a dark valley. Unfamiliar territory. But he says, I will fear no evil. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He doesn't say, I know that you will take all the evil away. He says, I will fear no evil. He recognizes there is going to be evil. But as one who trusts in the Lord, as one who trusts in God, and, and today, the more that we know about God as, as one who trusts in the Son of God, we know that we don't have to fear. We know what awaits us if we've been faithful. So we don't have to fear that evil that, that is all around us. The world is full of evil, Brother Far writes, but his courage, the, the shepherd's courage, was not in himself. It was not a courage that imagines a, a primrose path. It was the courage of having the Lord as his shepherd. Whose rod and staff give comfort and courage through every distress. Of course, there are many pleasures of this life. Pleasures that are not necessarily sinful. There are some things that we can enjoy in this life that, that God provides for us to enjoy. Turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Read with me verse 18. What verse? Uh, verse 18. Here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life which God gives him for it is his heritage. You know, we should be able to enjoy the fruits of our labors, so to speak. We should be able to enjoy the weekend when we have time off. We enjoy the five o'clock bell when it rings and it's time to go home. We enjoy going on vacation. Avery was talking about looking forward to a three-day weekend. It's good to enjoy those things because we need a rest from time to time, from our labors. God gives us those pleasures of life. And he intends for us to enjoy life. Second, or First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 11.
Peter writes, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil let his, and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Should we want to enjoy life? Should we want to love life? Absolutely, we should. And Peter tells us how to do that. Avoid sin. Trust in Jesus. John chapter 10 and verse 10, he says, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus wants us to enjoy life. To have a good life. To love life and to see good days. And in Christ we can. Not only because we're in Christ, but well, be, because of the hope that that gives us. Because being in Christ is more than just this life. It's more than just what's going to happen tomorrow. Being in Christ gives us something to look forward to eternally when this life ends. So to have life and to have it more abundantly is why Jesus, why he came. But troubles come to everybody. It rains on the just and the unjust, doesn't it? Just because we are in Christ does not mean that we will, we will be spared from the heartaches of this life, the pain of this life, the disappointments. Put whatever word you want in there. We're going to experience some bad stuff as long as we live in this world. Job chapter 3. Verses 25 and 26. Job says, For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. And what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest. For trouble comes. Who was Job? He was an upright man. He was an upright man. I think that's right. Absolutely. That's, that's how God described him mm -hmm. back in chapter 1. Mm -hmm. He said, have you considered, this is in verse 8 of, of Job chapter 1. Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth. A blameless. An upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And what was Satan's response? Well, you, yeah. you protected him. Yeah. You put a You've blessed him too much, God. Yeah. That's why he loves you. That's why he respects you. That's why he shuns evil. And so God allowed Satan. To attack him. He allowed him to. Take the lives of his children. His servants. He allowed him to ruin him financially. Take away his crops. And his, his cattle. And, and then Job says. Trouble comes. That's an understatement isn't it? Trouble comes. But he's an upright man. He's a blameless man. Just because we are upright and blameless does not protect us from the fact that trouble will come. We're assured of it in the New Testament. Paul told Timothy, if you want to be righteous, and I'm paraphrasing here, he said, if you want to be righteous, if you want to be a Christian, you are going to suffer persecution. It's not a maybe. 
It's a fact. It's going to happen. And Brother Parr says there at the end of that paragraph, at that section, this is not to borrow trouble or to dread the future, but to remind us that we need a shepherd to lead us into whatever dark valleys we are forced to go. We talked about Matthew 6, 24, or 34. We talked about it several times, how, how uh, you know, Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to have its own troubles to worry about. Just live today, right, Sue? So. I can't imagine how he coped with losing his whole family. Yeah, especially the way his friends and his wife talked to him afterwards, <laughs> right? Yeah, he friends. His friends. Right. Well, his friendlies. I, I, I mean, I've said the same thing with friends like that who needs enemies. Right. But in a way, they came and sat for like three days and didn't yes. say anything. Right. And that might have been the best thing they yeah. did for me. Yeah. Because sometimes, sometimes if you say the wrong thing, it's worse than, than not saying anything. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to imagine what he went through. He what what he thought. Yeah, he, he was facing his own health struggles at the same time. Yeah. Um, but he was upright. <laughs> he was blameless. And in all of this, Job sinned not. Did he question God? Yeah. Yeah, he did. He said, why are you letting this happen to me, God? God said, who are you to question me, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to, you know, we need to recognize it's okay to, to pray for ourselves when we're facing these situations. And it's okay to say to God, why? But in the end, we need to know that he is in control. And he is the shepherd and, and he leads us through those valleys of, of shadows of death. Girl? Well, all of Job's friends just knew they couldn't accept the fact, but they knew that Job, Job had done something bad because God, God was punishing mm -hmm. him. And, it had to be his fault. And, <laughs> and they, they were sincere when they believed this. Yeah. Although it's not correct, but yet they were sincere. And just like all of us, when we're sincere about something, we push it until somebody proves it's wrong. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, you know, he, he, he had those friends who doubted his integrity. They, they said, there, there's got to be something wrong here, Joe. You did something to bring this on yourself. And, you know, we, we've got the same kind of thoughts in the back of our heads sometimes, don't we? Mm -hmm. When something bad comes, what did I do? What did I do to deserve this? I mean, maybe I do deserve it, but what did I do? Just tell me. <laughs> so, yeah, but you're right, you know, that... They were sincere in what they believed, um, even though they didn't have all the facts. Right. And, and God doesn't, God doesn't send these things to us. Correct. Then it's going to come from God. He, he allowed he it allows to happen. He allows it to happen, yeah. but he doesn't cause it. Correct. Because, you know, when people will lose a loved one, and they'll say, well, God needed that person, and God took it. I mean, yeah. he, he's not. Right, right. God's ultimate purpose, stated in Second Peter chapter three, is for us all to come to repentance. Yeah. That's His ultimate purpose. Yeah. And and sometimes He may use situations to kind of open our eyes, but that doesn't mean that He caused those situations yeah. to happen. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the next section. Talking about the shadow of death. And Brother Farr does uh, acknowledge that this can be used metaphorically sometimes. You know, we talk about any, any kind of problem that we may be facing, severe problem, as a dark shadow, as a dark valley, a uh, shadow of death. But, but really, I think this does refer to the shadow of death. The shepherd was leading sheep through this valley. Again, he didn't have any idea what was waiting for him. 
bear, a lion, whatever it may be. He could have been literally walking to his death. Turn over to Psalm 90. I know it's more poetically stated in the King James and in American Standard, but I'm reading from the New King James. Uh, Psalm 90, verses 10 through 12. The days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Of course, the American standard is what David Farr um, quotes from. The days of our years are three score years and ten. Or even by reason of strength, four score years. I, I don't know why the, the three score, four score just sounds a little bit more poetic. Uh, but, but the New King James Version, most modern versions update it to our common language. It's talking about seven years or eighty years. A score is twenty. So he's, he's talking about 70 or 80 years. That's what we can expect. Now on the other end, Job 21. Job 21, 23 through 26. Can anyone, oh I'm sorry, uh, 23. One dies in his full strength. Being holy at ease and secure, his pails are full of milk and the marrow of his bones is moist. Another man bear, dies in the bitterness of his soul, never having eaten with pleasure. They lie down alike in the dust and worms cover them. You know, some people are able to make it to 70 or 80 years. Some people longer. Other people, they're taken away at their full strength. We don't know why. Sometimes things just happen. You know, we, we don't know when it's going to happen. But, as Brother Farr points out, the point can be made that one who survives into his 70s or 80s should know that he is much nearer to that valley. To number our days is to be realistic. Whether many or few, whether sooner or later, the end must come. In Psalm 39, 4, the psalmist said, Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 beginning in verse 1. Remember now the Creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not dark, and the clouds do not return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through the windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of the grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of music are brought low, also they are afraid of height and the terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden. The desire falls, fails. For man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loose. 
or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. The inspired preacher's point in this passage to youth is that they need to make good use of their present advantages because time may come when health and vigor are gone. For seven verses, he describes the failings that come with age and the inevitability of death. For those of us who are in the later years, Brother Farr says, with the changes that come with age, this text seems less poetry and more reality. This applies at every stage of the Christian's life. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 12. Romans 13, 11, and 12, Paul says, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us Put on the armor of light. Each day, we're not only closer to death, we're closer to eternity. We're closer to either salvation or condemnation, depending on where we stand with God. And so Paul tells us, wake up. Cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light while you still can because the day will come when you won't have that choice anymore. We have to do it while we can. So we've got two things that we're looking at here. In death, do we face defeat or do we face victory? The purpose of this study it's not to dwell on the melancholy, the negative, to, to think about how, how terrible our lives are, how, you know, woe is me, but rather to emphasize the need that we have for deliverance from the unholy bondage of fearing death. Christians don't have to fear death. Go back to Ecclesiastes again. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 8. Ecclesiastes 8, 8. No one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit. And no one has power in the day of death. There is no release from that war. And wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. Brother Farr says from Eden, the prince of darkness has kept the world enslaved by a chain no one can shake off. And youth and health and vigor... It may be only a passing thought of something everyone knows is real. But it's too distant for them. They don't give it serious thought because I'm only 40, 46. <laughs> My death is, is years away, decades away. Well, I don't know that, do I? Nobody knows that. Sure. Sure. I could, I could drop dead of a heart attack right now. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, it doesn't matter how young or how old you are. But for the youth, it's harder to think about that. Oh, yeah. 
because we are young, because we are full of vigor. Well, I don't have quite as much vigor as I used to, but... <laughs> But still, you know, at 46, I don't think about death because in my mind, it is still decades away. I don't have a, any expectation of dying anytime soon. But when that time comes, there are some who pass in relative comfort and ease. There are others who struggle to survive the inevitable with every ounce of their being. The Ecclesiastes writer says nobody has the power over their own spirit when that time comes. Nobody can fight off death. What is there to fear? To an extent, the unknown. Yes, we have the promises of God, but... Because we haven't been there. But we haven't been there yet, right. So there's still things that we don't know. You know, and this is a poor illustration, and I'll admit that up front. I'm really looking forward to polishing the pulpit next month, or two months from now. But I've never been there. So there's a little bit of trepidation. It's going to be a huge crowd, and I know there's going to be people there that I know. There's still a little bit of anxiety in going somewhere that I've never been before. Not really knowing what to expect, because it, it's so much bigger than any other lectureship I've been to. But I know I'm going to have a good time. I know that I'm going to learn a lot. I hear the stories from those who have been in the past and how much they've benefited from it. God tells us that heaven is going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. But I've never been there before. And we don't see real pictures sure. of what we've got as glimpses. Yeah. You know, he, he speaks to us a, a lot in figurative language about it because well, we, can't, we can't comprehend it. Yeah, our minds couldn't. Our physical, finite minds, yeah. So there is a little bit of the fear of the unknown. Perhaps the fear of the separation from loved ones. Perhaps the fear of pain. Those who are struggling with, with disease at the end of their life. You know, they, they may be afraid of, of increased pain as the days linger. Uh, the fear of unfinished plans. You know, I really want to go here. I really want to do that. I think once we get to heaven, it won't matter what we wanted to do. Or what we wanted to do or go. Unresolved guilt. Things, things such as that. Even the agnostic who says we cannot know. They have to dread not knowing what the darkness might hold. Will there be something on the other side? What will it be? Those who, who insist that there is no afterlife at the end, they must fear what they don't know. Don't think they can think of what if there is. Maybe. Mm -hmm. One man, uh, Carlisle, said near the end of his life, I am as good as without hope. A sad old man gazing into the final chasm. Job asked the question, Job 14, 14, if a man die, shall he live Again, as Christians, we can answer that question. We can say, yep. The man who is faithful to God, he will live forever with God in heaven. Jesus has abolished death. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 10 Paul says that um, we'll start verse 9 who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose 
and grace which was given to us by Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus not only gives the answer, Jesus is the answer. We don't have to fear death because Jesus was victorious over death. And just as he was victorious, if we are faithful to him, we will be victorious as well. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm falling behind. Hebrews chapter 2. Verses 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power over death, that is the devil, and release those through fear of death, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Sometimes, Brother Farr says, losing a loved one is more frightening than the fear of our own mortality. Those who have experienced it know how dark the shadows are when we've said goodbye to the dearest on earth. When the Thessalonian Christians struggled with bereavement, Paul urged that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. As surely as God brought Jesus out of the tomb, so surely will God raise up the saints who have fallen asleep. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Where will we be with him? John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming back to get you. If it were not so, I would have told you. In my father's house, there are, are many rooms or many mansions, depending on what version you use. <laughs> but whether it's a room, whether it's a broom closet, whether it's Harry Potter living under the stair size, or a grand mansion, I don't care as long as I'm with him. It's enough to be in heaven with him. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. So when this corruptible, this body, is put on incorruption, when this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. We have victory in Jesus. Do we have hope? Or are we hopeless? David's comfort through the ominous valley was the assurance that thou art with me. We have that same assurance today, don't we? Jesus said it at the end of the Great Commission in Matthew. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 20. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 repeats that promise. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us. That is only a promise for those who are in Christ, though. It's a, it's a promise for, for his people. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, however. 
He talks about those which have no hope. When he's telling the Thessalonians, don't sorrow because you do have hope. So don't act like the people who don't have any hope. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12 talks about the, the Ephesian Gentiles who were once without hope. Why? Because they were without God in this world. Back to Ecclesiastes again. I said we were going to spend a lot of time in Job. I think we're getting into Ecclesiastes more. I don't know why Job just kind of stuck out in my mind. Ecclesiastes 8, verses 12 and 13. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times, and his days are prolonged, Yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before Him. But it will not be well with the wicked, nor will He prolong His days which are as a shadow, because He does not fear before God. One who hopes for heaven when he has no hope, only hopes in vain. What is hope? Let's define that. Because we need to know what hope is. It's not a wish. It's not a desire without determination. It is it's believing that something is going to happen because God said it is going to happen. And we have that hope because we have obeyed what God has told us to do. That's what hope is. Desire plus expectation we have this confidence because we know what God has said Titus chapter 3 verse 7 talks about being justified by his grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life <coughs> and in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2 talks about the hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie, promised before the world began. We have this expectation, this hope, because God said it and God cannot lie. If he says that he's going to do something, he's going to do it, period. No questions asked. We can be sure. We're either sure of this hope or hope is nothing at all. Christian faith is defined in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 as the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not yet seen. The NIV says faith is being sure of what we hope for. And certain of what we do not see. We live in a world of uncertainty. We live in a world of tragic disappointments. But we can be thankful that there is something for which we can be certain. We can be sure. We can have that confidence in what God says. Hope provides the sure and steadfast anchor for the soul, according to Hebrews 6.19. It's sustained by God's word, which is a light that shineth in the dark place. Even a place as dark as the valley of the shadow of death. A faulty faith lacks confidence in God's ability to give us what he has promised. Our hope is based on what God has told us. There's no empirical evidence that gives us a reason for hope. Science cannot affirm it. Science cannot deny it. We regard as silly or superstitious or at least mistaken the various reports of persons in comas or who were thought to be clinically dead who awakened to tell what it's like on the other side. It wasn't even two months ago that Grant County News ran a story in the religious section like that of, of some pastor 
who supposedly died and went to heaven and he saw all these buildings and and then he woke up and he saw two angels prancing around his hospital bed. That doesn't belong in any kind of newspaper. I love Grant County News, but they should not have printed that rubbish. It's what it is, plain and simple. That's why I asked George we would stop breathing. Yeah. He actually died and came. Right. I said, well, did you see that bright light? I didn't see anything. Right. Said, well, you right. must be born in a <laughs> Folks, trust in what God has told us. Don't put your trust in some fancy fables right. made up by false teachers. I mean, neither one of us believe this stuff. So right. Yeah. This is trying to lighten it. Yeah. Romans chapter 8 verse 24 tells us that hope that is seen is not hope. For what man seeth, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? Christian hope relies on the promises of God, knowing that with all God, with all things, uh, with God, all things are possible, and that He is able to exceedingly, uh, abundantly above all that we ask or think. Let your imagination run wild. God can out imagine you. He can bless you more than you could ever dream. Are you going to heaven? There was a preacher that was preaching and he started a, a sermon that way. Maybe in a gospel meeting. He said, raise your hand if you're going to heaven. Not everybody raised their hand. So he proceeded to preach for the next several minutes on the confidence that we can have that yes I am going to heaven it's not arrogance to say this is what God has said and, and I've obeyed and I've done what he said to do and because of what he has said I can know I am going to heaven it's first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1 says we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. A house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2 says, Beloved, now, as, now are, are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we know. We, we shall be like him, for we shall be see him as he is. Then at the end of the sermon, he said, do you know you're going to heaven? Everybody raised their hand. We can have that confidence that if we have done what God has asked us to do, we can have confidence that he will do what he said he would do. Questions or comments? All right. Next week, we'll talk about the loss of a child. Pages 28 through 30 in our book uh, is an article on that. So please read that. I will probably, this, this article is very personal. Um. It, it was written by someone who had just lost a child just months before this publication came out. A three-year-old child. There's not a lot of scriptures in the article. Uh, so we will probably not talk much about the article itself other than to highlight some of the main points. But we will we'll discuss what the Bible says about losing a child. So be prepared to discuss that next week. Thank you very much for your attention.